was from Arte, the uh, French German broadcaster, up until um, last December. And I decided to resign from this uh, wonderful, amazing job that I did for about 10 years to uh, entirely dedicate myself to transmedia. I started getting involved in it really seriously about six years ago, but I guess I was destined to be um, a transmedia man since uh, a very, very long time ago because I was a dancer for a while. Um, Simon, this is something I think we share. And um, at the same time that I was doing a master's degree in international marketing, so I guess I've been a schizophrenic uh, person and therefore a transmedia person all my life. So what I would like to do, I there will be a few things I will skip through because Domenico addressed them. What I would like to do is just go through a few of the reasons that I see are um, almost um, unavoidable uh, to get involved or to get curious about transmedia and then I would like to illustrate it uh, through some particular project that I'm working on. I will go very briefly through this because Domenico, you talked about this, but when we talk about transmedia, it's such a new form that words and concepts are not yet crystallized. They're not yet really defined. But when we talk about transmedia, we really talk about four kinds of different things. Web content is not really transmedia. It's just stories and materials that are written to um, uh, be uh, shown on the web. Cross-media, like Domenico said, is the same story that goes to different platforms. Marketing transmedia is how transmedia was born, and we talked about this. It, it's a way that uh, mostly in cinema, where I come from, studios came up with to promote the film and to entice um, audience to buy tickets to go see the film. But that's where concepts like ARGs were born, ARGs for Altered Reality Games. What I'm interested in, and what I think we're talking about here, is native transmedia. It's when you organically find the reasons within your story that call for interaction, immersion and participation. That is what I find truly challenging and I think if there's a reason why we as an audience will want to make the effort and engage and participate in the experience of a story world in an active way, it will be if there are specific and strong compelling reasons to do so and break out of the passive mode of a listener or a viewer. One of the first reasons why I think we cannot avoid but get curious about transmedia is because television and film are already old media. They're going through the crisis of finding distribution, finding exposure, and they're confronted with the issue of the interface between the work, between a movie, and the audience. In independent filmmaking in particular, as you know, it is becoming more and more difficult to find theaters to show the films in. And when you find one or a few, you, you only stay in those theaters for maybe a week or two. So the traditional interface that uh, both television and film have been using is being questioned and challenged for that reason um, you need to go out and consider that when you work in film and television that you are no longer defined by the medium that you are using. It, there used to be a time, like in Domenico's example, where when you said television, you meant the screen. And when you mean, when you mean movies, you mean mostly the theater. So the, the um, mediums, these aging mediums, are no longer defined by their platform, but they're defined by their content. And that changes everything, and this is why televisions, for instance, are uh, looking at how to officially incorporate the online audience for the catch-up TV programs or for their web content into the bulk of their uh, global audience measurement. 
Um, and this is the reason why also broadcasters need to go out online to go and uh, get involved in the web content because that's where the audience is. This is what we were saying before. Another reason why we need to look at transmedia is that all media are converging. We all know that uh, our smartphones can do so many things that we don't need to buy specific devices for one use. Uh, game consoles, um, home appliances, and smartphones, tablets can do more and more stuff. So one platform allows a massive amount of possible different usage. Um, this is something that implies the relationship, uh, that the relationship we have with storytelling is being changed to uh, becoming almost a commodity among other services that we can access through the platforms that we are using. The, the way this is illustrated uh, is um, through uh, graphs like this. You don't need to try and understand it. It's okay if you just watch it as a work of art. But the, you can see that this graph tries to analyze all the way into 2025 plus the way the different medias converge. I will make the presentation available if you want to go into details of this, but uh, very complex studies are being done and this is the same graph as Domenico was showing used for um, the convergence of media and showing how all platforms are starting to converse with each other. <laughs> Nevertheless, one of the, the paradoxes that we are confronted with, the fact that we know that all that platforms are multi-usage, uh, does not mean that everything is the same. Meaning, if you watch a movie on your smartphone or on your, on your tablet, we know very well that it's not the same experience as if we watch it in a, a big theater with a large screen and great sound. So there's definitely a perception that there's a hierarchy. The same way that if you look at uh, the restaurant business, for instance, that basically restaurants are here as an option to feed ourselves. If we look at the need, the basic need of feeding ourselves, uh, we have a choice from buying a sandwich and having a microwave heaten uh, dish to going out for a pizza with a friend, going to a fancy restaurant, all the way to uh, wedding banquets, for instance. And all different occasions call for different ways of satisfying the basic need of feeding ourselves. There is definitely a hierarchy and all these needs coexist. All these ways of satisfying this need coexist in the same street, you can have a, a fast food joint, you have a fancy restaurant, and you have a pizzeria. All of that coexists and that satisfies the need of the same people at different moments. You can do the same with the, the, the same parallel between the media industry and fashion. Uh, for, in, for instance, films and festivals could be compared to haute couture, films and theatres to prêt à porter. I'm French, sorry, and that's why the fashion uh, idea comes up. Uh, television would be uh, mass production, and internet would be discount. This is not this is not uh, a, a comparison on content because very often a lot of uh, uh, stuff you can find online on the internet is uh, much more interesting than some of the stuff you see on traditional screens in theaters. Another reason to get involved is that, um, and this has been uh, outlined a few years ago, the studies show that a young adult coming into uh, active life in society today will have spent as much time playing games as they, would, they will have spent studying, and that's about 10,000 hours. And the other thing which is interesting is that if you spend 10,000 hours at doing something, there's a very good chance that you're going to become pretty good at doing that particular thing. So what we are seeing today is that we're seeing a whole generation 
of young adults coming into the world of uh, business, work, and social life um, as virtuoso gamers. What does that imply? That implies that gaming, playing to them, to you, it has become something completely natural, something you expect to experience in almost every aspect of your professional and personal life. This, this is why the whole process of gamification is being so um, uh, interesting in the way that it brings game dynamics, gameplay to all kinds of different sectors of uh, society. And that impacts the way we relate to stories. It will develop more and more a uh, behavior that expects to have a chance to feedback, to react, to participate, to contribute to the story that we're being told. Because that's the essence of game, to uh, place the player in the seat of the main character, doesn't it? Because if you uh, buy a game and you don't play it, nothing happens. You are the main character when you're a gamer. So this uh, in involves your wanting to be involved in the stories that are being told. And in this way, this, uh, the, the, the transmedia ways of telling stories will apply itself the same way to the, the way people behave and transforming uh, the, the passive traditional audience into active participants. And this will impact the pyramid of the audience as we know it. Uh, we know today that confronted with an interactive content, most audience will still behave in a passive traditional way. About 85% of the audience will still look at uh, interactive content in a completely traditional, passive way without responding to any of the suggestions to interact with the story. This is because the majority of the audience is still expecting to remain passive and be told a story to. 10% uh, more or less of the audience confronted with interactive content will respond they will respond to questions, they will, they will do what they're suggested to do, and they will become more active, but in a, respond, in a responsive way. Only 5%, more or less, of the audience will actually contribute content and will go beyond what is expected of them within the story world to uh, participate. Uh, Domenico talked about Pottermore, and Pottermore is the perfect example for this, where it reached a massive quantity of people who got involved because the fan base for Harry Potter is huge. But in a more traditional and more independent content situation, we would, uh, we would see only a fraction of the audience actually getting involved. But the fact that they are doing what they're doing, contributing content, is uh, has a driving, a locomotive effect for the rest of the audience. And as few as they may be, they are very often a driving force behind the, um, um, the participation aspect of a story. As I said before, because the younger generation is now taking it for granted that they can participate, that they can play, that they can immerse, and that they expect to do this with a story. Progressively, what we're going to see is that the spectators, part of the audience, will um, diminish and will increase, naturally, the portion of participants and creators. This is also related to the fact that um, we have an evolving perception of what reality is. We used to think, and we still think for most of us, that the reference for our perception of the world is what we call reality, meaning physical reality, what we can touch, what we can see, what we can talk about, because we feel that we are seeing, touching, feeling the same thing. 
What the new media have done and what the internet has developed and the gaming culture has developed is the fact that now we have a chance to experience reality in a multi-layered way. When I immerse myself in a game um, online, uh, I can play that game for hours and hours, forgetting who I am. And there is even this uh, extreme phenomenon called, uh, as the, called uh, hikikomori by the Japanese, where you have people actually dying from forgetting their physical reality. Recently, uh, a young kid was found dead in his bedroom where he was confined because he was communicating with his parents only through SMS and through uh, email and his mother would just uh, lay the food in front of his door for him to pick it up whenever he would want. He was living um, in his bedroom and he was found dead after having played 57 hours non-stop without sleeping, feeding himself or drinking. And you have those men also who have been found dead in playing arcades in Korea and China where they were found dead actually about 12 hours after they died uh, in front of their screen after having played over 60 hours without moving, feeding themselves or drinking. So what I mean by this is that the uh, experience of being someone else and someone you choose to be online within a virtual world is such an engaging experience that you can actually much prefer living in that virtual reality because you feel more comfortable with the identity you've chosen to uh, to endorse in this virtual world much more than in the physical reality that you find boring. So this idea that reality is actually fiction is also something that we do every day on the social networks. What is Facebook if not a constant staging of ourselves? The pictures that we post on Instagram or the the, the, the posts that we do on the social networks that we use, all of them reflect a certain image of ourselves that we want to build. I, I, I love it sometimes when you go to, uh, to parties or events where people are supposed to have fun and they're actually bored because they're just standing there and drinking, but then someone pulls out uh, their smartphone and takes a camera and everyone goes like, this, and they're really super happy and they're, and they're really having the best fun and once the photo's taken they go back and just drink and getting bored. So they will post that picture of, of them having fun, you know, and that will reflect who they would like to appear to be. So the idea that we are constantly constructing a fictitious uh, identity is something I think we can all relate to because we, we're constantly feel that we're living under the eye of our permanent odd audience, who is the other. But the same way, like I said, fiction is becoming reality when it is all involving in uh, the way we perceive ourselves under our avatar identity in virtual world. Nevertheless, like it was said before by Domenico, the basic need that we have is to tell each other stories. We tend to forget that transcending reality, transcending the everyday life that we have to go through minute by minute is as deep and essential a need as drinking, sleeping, uh, feeding ourselves or having sex. It's um, it's so fundamental that this is something that we do all the time. Religion is a way of telling each other stories. Uh, all, the, all the interaction that telling each other stories involves is something that we need because we are social animals. Therefore, the, the, the one thing that I find uh, interesting is that transmedia, a transmedia approach, breaks the paradigm under which we have been operating if we are filmmakers or producers, people involved in media. This paradigm was, up until now, that we are supposed to learn the craft 
of making a film the same way that it's been done for the last hundred years, because it hasn't really changed. I mean, of course, we use digital cameras now instead of cameras like this, but it really doesn't change much in terms of how it's structured, how we have to build up crews and uh, sets, etc. It's basically worked this way, and we think we need to learn how to make a movie, for instance. I think now with transmedia, we can change this perspective and decide that what we do is not to make movies, is to tell stories. And if you start thinking of yourselves as a storyteller, as opposed to a filmmaker, for instance, you all of a sudden just break out of a craft into an art form for which you have at your disposal a much bigger toolbox that you can use. And if I had one um, advice or one recommendation to share, it would be this. Don't think of yourselves as specialists of a particular craft, filmmaking for instance. Think of yourself as storytellers and allow yourself to think in a transmedia way um, to use writing, to use designing, to use interactive um, design to tell your stories, provided that those tools, those interactive, immersive devices or designs that you can use to tell your stories are actually coming organically from within the story, within the theme you have to tell. Some stories do not lend themselves to interaction or immersion. Uh, then that's fine, they just remain traditional, linear, passive stories. But some of them, when you start really massaging them, you start finding that they have a lot of potential to involve the audience into an interactive relationship. But enough of uh, general talking, I'd like to uh, share some of the projects that I'm working on to try and illustrate and be more pragmatic. One of the first examples I wanted to share is more related to transmedia marketing. Uh, about a year ago, we launched, I say we because at the time I was working for Arte, and it's a film we co-produced. It's a very, very small independent movie, first feature, called Louise Wimmer, uh, by a uh, first um, director in France, Cyril Menegin. When the film was finished, it's, a, it's an amazing film, it's a very, very good film, but a very dark film. It tells the story of this woman, Louise, who lives in her car, uh, lost her job and lives off uh, odd jobs, and she has applied to a social service to try and get an apartment. Not really easy to market, not funny, not sexy, uh, the worst kind of story from a marketing point of view. So. I suggested we do one thing, because in the movie there's a scene where Louise gives her cell phone number to, um, to uh, someone, and we used that, and we had 12,000 post-its that we hand-wrote with just her name, Louise Wimmer, and her cell phone number. And we posted those in... Um, in um, uh, ev everywhere. So I will show you a little account of what it did. I hope it works because the connection seems to be a bit slow. So while it loads, let's see if it works. Hmm, seems slow. Uh, so, th before I show you, th th what we did is that we posted those uh, post-its for two weeks before the release of the film in the French theatres, and two weeks after. Um, it was on car, uh, car doors, on buildings, in the subway, it was really uh, everywhere. And when people would call the number on the post-it, they would not reach an answering machine, they would actually reach Louise Wimmer as the character, 
and the actress who played the part was answering and they, there would be those people who would have no idea who she was and what this was about and they would ask her why did she post this and she would explain her story, she would explain the story of the movie. And there were people who would say, it's funny, you have the same name as the name of a movie that's coming out, are you related? And she said, yes, I am the character in the movie. And they would start engaging in conversations and then that would go on with people who would have seen the movie and who um, wanted to know more and they wanted to know well, what happens to you now? What has happened since the end of the movie? Because at the end of the movie, she finally gets the apartment that she was craving for. Um, she started getting love letters, she started getting uh, gifts, poems, and we had to actually hire two other actresses to be able to answer the number of calls that we had. Uh, of the 12,000 post-its, 13% materialized into an actual call. When we asked a small panel of people, why did you call? Why did you make this decision that you should call this number? Do you know what they answered? All of them, and it was our surprise. They said, I called because it was handwritten. If it had been printed, I would not have bothered. This would have, you know, this would have been a, an advertising stunt. Um, but I called because it was handwritten. And I learned something very important with that experience, is that we crave authenticity. We crave truth. We crave real. We crave real contact with real people. And that's what social networking is supposed to do, is to establish a friendship network, but it doesn't really work, does it? It's really the real experience that we want. So the reason why people called was because it was handwritten and there must have been someone real behind that post-it. Another project that I'm working on is, actually I cannot say very much about it because there's a secret uh, dimension to it, but it has a temporary working uh, name, title called Ultra Trailer. This project is a very ambitious uh, film project, it's a transmedia film project that will um, materialize into a user experience that will unfold between June and September 2015. The way it's done, it, and uh, sorry, it's a bit blurred, um, is that it's a, a uh, project which is composed of six different blocks. The first two blocks, called Run and Runner, are documentary blocks. Um, and I will explain why we have split the project in different blocks in a minute. Run is a feature documentary about altar trailing. I don't know if you are familiar with altar trail, but for those who are not, I will um, say that it's the most extreme part of the running culture. The people who run altar trail races run for 250, 300 kilometers at one stretch without stopping, which means 
they run for some of them for over 30 hours up to 40 hours non-stop. Of course, it's a very dangerous um, sport because it's very extreme. You can imagine the levels of uh, stress that your body goes through when you run such races. Um, and the interesting thing is that most people who run those races, after about 10 hours of running non-stop, reach altered states of consciousness. They start hallucinating, they start feeling uh, strange sensations. Um, and what's interesting is that most of them have recurrent hallucinations. After a while, when they run different races, they always reach the point where they find the same hallucination coming back. Um, and this is being studied by scientists right now. So this would be a 90 minute long feature for television and runner will be an iPad interactive sensory experience where we will um, record uh, the uh, race of a, um, a runner uh, with all kinds of biometric devices so that we can use the data of his quantified self and, and uh, retrace all the different steps of the experience from the, uh, the, uh, the way uh, the runner will have experienced it himself and try to share this uh, with, the, with the audience. The four other blocks, and when I say blocks, it's the bubbles that you can see on the sides, are fiction. Out of the two documentary blocks, we will create an event which will naturally, organically sprout from the documentary uh, world of altar trailing and will develop into fiction. The fiction will be broken down into four different steps and elements. The first one will be an online uh, news account for two weeks around the event that we will have created. It will be followed by a transformative live uh, community which will last six weeks. Some of you may be familiar with Burning Man. Uh, does that ring any bell to anyone? Uh, Burning Man is a transformative festival in, um, in Nevada that takes place every end of summer in the US and it's a temporary city that is built in the desert and 70,000 people live in this uh, temporary city under completely different rules than the usual social rules because it's a city called Black Rock City where uh, everything is allowed and only two things are forbidden, violence and money. You cannot use money at Black Rock City. It's all about giving and sharing. Aside from this, everything else is allowed. This, is, this uh, started this concept of transformative festivals or transformative communities. We will try and do uh, such one uh, within the frame of that fiction. And then the, the, the third block is actually a game. It will be a quest which will be related to the fictional events. And it will end with the fourth block, which will be a feature movie, fiction movie, that will tell all the backstory of the whole universe. Uh, you have the timeline uh, along the, the, the project, and what is called Lateral is actually a pure player uh, media that we are starting this fall, uh, which will be connected to the whole story and will allow us to control the way we spread the information. The reason why we broke down the whole universe into uh, six clearly identified blocks is mostly for financial reasons. Within the story, all these blocks are totally intertwined. There are characters that travel from one to the other so that we seed information about the game, for instance, within all of the other blocks but we identify them as products so that we can finance them differently. Run will be financed entirely by Arte uh, as a feature documentary and it will be financed as a standalone um, uh, film on ultra trailing, this exactly the same way, old fashioned way, uh, uh, docs are financed in France. Runner is going to be financed three ways. 
uh, is going to be financed by the Reunion Island uh, because that's where we will shoot the race. It's the race called the uh, Crazy Man Diagonal and it's about crossing the Reunion Island from east to west through the mountains and forests. So Reunion Island is financing part of it. Uh, the, the northern region in France will be financing the uh, development of the app through different development labs they have. And uh, we will also have uh, public money uh, applied to uh, development of interactive uh, content. The, um, the transformative community in southern France will be um, financed mostly by the small uh, city, the department and the region where this will be, will be happening and we will be charging a daily fee for people to participate in this. The Quest game will be financed by a foreign country, it's an, it's an international co-production where this particular country, I can't say which country it is, uh, is, um, has applied a new system of funding which is very, very uh, new and interesting uh, for game development and this will be uh, mostly financed there. We are including scenes from the last block from the movie in the same country so that we can get funding both for the game and for the, the film scenes. And the fiction film will also be financed by Arte as a counterpart to the documentary um, uh, in a traditional way uh, that old-fashioned uh, fiction films are financed in France. This, this project is currently in development. We're starting shooting, we're starting by doing Runner, the interactive um, sensory app in the fall this year, and then a filming run next year and the fiction uh, towards the end of next year. Uh, this is a new thing that we are doing and I will let you watch the little trailer first. So this geolocalized app, Cinema City, is going to start uh, rolling at the end of this month in Paris. And basically what it is, it's an app you can transport within your iPhone and that allows you to access a scene from a movie when you are at the actual spot where it was shot from. Um, so the way it will work is that it will be, it will be designed, there will be a website that will show all the spots where there is an excerpt. And when you are looking, for instance, at a uh, place where um, you are in Paris, where your hotel is in Paris, it will identify the closest excerpt that is available to you. In this particular case, it's uh, the film about uh, Edith Piaf with Marion Cotillard, and it's La Vie en Rose. If I, it shows the poster, of the film, if I click on the poster, I access the um, data uh, that are synthesized about the movie. Um, I can see on the map that there are three excerpts of the same movie at different locations in Paris, and I can have information on the basic uh, cast, director, and a little summary of the, uh, of the film. The main point, that the main way we have found to, to do this is this button. On your app, you will be able to access directly the, the film on the VOD platform who will have given us the excerpts for free as promotion 
for them, uh, for us to drive audience towards them. It's the economic model that we are using for this. We get the excerpts for free from the VOD platforms and the platforms get people through the app to uh, watch the film. The excerpts will be combined in what we call cinewalks. I can see, for instance, that uh, this film is included in four cinewalks. Those cinewalks are walks around a neighborhood in Paris where you can go on a theme and you can see different films. So in this case, I choose a century in Montmartre and when I click on the cinewalk, I can see the walk on the map, so I can, I can plan my walk in Paris, and I know I will be seeing six excerpts. The, post, the films that I can see are listed on the, on the right-hand corner, and I, I can see that I will be seeing excerpts of these six films, and if I click on each of the posters, I access again to the movie uh, uh, data. What I can do is that once I've seen this, I'm for instance here in Vilnius, I'm planning a weekend in Paris, and I'm thinking this is a nice way to visit Paris, I can add it to my wish list so I know that this is one of the walks that I want to do. If I don't have a smartphone or a, or a tablet, I can uh, download just the PDF of this, I can still have the walk, and maybe I know the films and I will recognize the locations. And if I'm interested in doing it, I then can download the walk within, with, with its interactive features so that I don't have to pay outrageous roaming costs while I'm in Paris and I can access it exactly the same way, but it will have the pre-download. The budget for uh, Cinema City is 320,000 euros. Uh, we're releasing it at the end of this month. It will be available in three different languages, in French, English, and German. And we are happy that we were just accepted on the App Store uh, the day before yesterday. And it will be available on Android. Um, when we go in, when we start rolling, we will start working on the second phase, which aim is to have 1,500 excerpts in, uh, at the beginning of 2014. Uh, we will add a game dimension where you, if you guess the title, the director, the year, you gain points and those points will be redeemable um, in uh, invitations to come on set uh, for films that are currently being shot in Paris. Um, we, there's also a feature where when you are on the spot where you have access to scene from a movie, you can actually film the scene yourself. You can reinterpret the scene if you want yourself, and then it will pile up behind the um, behind the um, uh, excerpt of the movie you've seen. One last information: what we are finding out right now is that uh, this project is actually a format, and we have been um, questioned. We have been um, asked by different cities and different partners to do the same thing in other film cities. We're currently discussing with organizations to do it in Los Angeles, in New York, in Namibia. The government of Namibia has asked us to apply it to the country, Mexico City, Rome, and Berlin. And maybe Vilnius, why not? Hello. Hello, rien, j'en ai assez. Tu sais, je me fixe. Tu sais, je me fixe. I'd like to say a word about um, LARPing and live, uh, live action uh, role-playing. Uh, in March 2012, about a year ago, uh, I was invited by the La Gaité Lyrique, which is a digital cultural center in Paris, to design an event for the closing of an exhibition called 2062, 
which was uh, an exhibition about the future. And I um, designed a, a live experience, which we called the Time Submarine, where we invited 70 people from the audience to come and lock themselves together within the main space of the facility for over 48 hours without any way to measure the present time. Uh, 70, we actually were worried that no one would like to do this and the tickets were 60 euros for the experience. Uh, we sold all the tickets in uh, half an hour um, and we had a long waiting list. The experience was a very intense and strong one. We filmed it, we um, had questionnaires that were filled out by the participants and were currently working on the data visualization and animation of all the data that we uh, collected. It was very intense. Five of the submarine participants left during the submarine experience because they couldn't stand it. Um, it there was a lot of um, uh, moments when there was a lot of tension. And what I learned through this experience is that when we talk about participation and immersion, when we talk in transmedia about having the audience get involved, and when you start wanting to involve the audience in a live physical dimension, then all of a sudden you find that the material you're confronted with is no longer the fiction, it's no longer the story, that you're dealing with. It's the human psychology, it's the human emotion that develops at that moment. And all kinds of unplanned situations happened that we had to improvise about. This is what you were talking about, Domenico, about the art of including improvisation into the mix. And we definitely need to do this when you are confronted with human uh, situation. Uh, what we also found out is that the relationship to time is incredibly elastic. After only uh, maybe 30 hours within the submarine, people were off, some people were off by already six hours. They thought we were six hours later than we were. I was the only one who had a watch to measure time, but it was a very interesting uh, lesson in how relative our relationship to time can be because I realized our relationship to time is really only our relationship to the way we measure time. Another thing we did which was very exciting is that after um, uh, coming here to um, uh, coming to Sweden in June of 2012 and Matthias who is here was a participant with me and, and Jofe uh, drove us there. We participated into, in the LARP Just a Little Loving. Maybe some of you have heard of this LARP in Sweden. And we did this last June. It was an incredibly transformative experience for me. And when I came back to Paris, I thought that there would be an interesting experience to do to apply the LARP mechanic to a movie. So we, at the time, I was putting together a film festival on Arte and on tour, which is a French film about a group of women uh, from America who are burlesque dancers who tour the uh, small circuit of small cities in France. Um, we were going to show this film and I decided to invite people to come and LARP the movie. What it meant was that they were supposed to see the movie first then they had to choose which character, ideally, they would like to be. We casted 32 people uh, in the audience who applied and gave them, each of, each of them, a role in the movie. Then they were invited to a secret location, uh, just them, there was no audience, nothing. They had to bring their own costume, their own makeup. They watched the movie in character and once the movie ended, they just improvised and continued the story of the movie wherever they wanted. And they did that for five hours during the whole night after watching the movie. It was an incredible experience and it was very, very liberating. Um, I just uh, I will tell you what this is. So it was, it was something that the, um, 
uh, all the people who got involved, there were, of all the people who participated, only a handful, maybe two or three, were LARPers who had done uh, role playing before. All of them, it was the, the first time for them. And uh, they, along the game, they decided, the women decided that they should plan an audition so that they could be a part of a new show. And women who had never stripped before um, actually went into this uh, exercise uh, and um, had to go beyond the natural, um, uh, how can I say, resistance to uh, undressing in front of other people. But they did, and the, the, the ending that they found to the whole story was so moving that we all stayed together and then we met again Two weeks later, everyone came back in their costumes on their own initiative to watch the screening of the movie on Arte that night. And what happened that night is that we received two videos uh, from the actual actresses of the movie to support the gamers. And oops, I'll, show, so I, I'll first show you this, which is an edit of the LARP that we, um, that we did, oops, that we did, but it may take time to load. So what happened was the, um, the, the fact that uh, the actresses actually sent us uh, messages, video messages, that they could To support the to support the players, I'll I'll wait a little bit while it loads, and the <laughs> sorry. Um, what what happens what happened in this situation was one of the most rewarding experiences you can get in transmedia is when it starts to um, to create a virtuous circle where we larped the movie. You know, because we liked the movie. The, the, the people who did it, did it because they liked the movie and they wanted the experience. And then all of a sudden, the movie itself started answering back and sending, it was the actual actresses who started uh, talking to the players. Then they sent a message saying, we're gonna be in France in a month, touring a few cities. Could we all meet and have a party together so that we want to meet who played us, who played me? And we did. And then the last surprise was when we, uh, after the screening together of the film on Arte, when we were together in a bar to watch it, um, uh, the director himself showed up. Mathieu Amalric came because he wanted to meet those people who had interpreted again his story and he wanted to know the details of what they had improvised, what kind of sequel they had found to the end of his uh, of his movie, and that was an incredible experience to have it go full circle. It's Julie and Rocky with Dirty in the background. We're here. Lark. Said, Lark. I said Larkland. I said Larkland. Hi, everybody in Larkland. This woman has a charisma of 18. Oh my gosh, her power is so high. All right, Larper. All right, Larper. Who's going right, to play Larper. me in the TV movie, huh? You think you can play me? I'll play you. Yeah, I'll play you. No. I'll play you like a harp. Get off. Get off. Hey, I just want to say thanks a lot for all your hard work and effort into recreating a fantastic movie. And I hope you enjoyed yourself. Because I like being someone else, too. Hey everyone in the Lark Land, I hope that you played me real good and real nice, and um, uh, I, I hope it's nice. Have fun, don't suck. We are the Larpers, Je m'appelle Mademoiselle Kitten on the Keys, Petite Chat, Sur de Touche, Du Piano Bien Sur, Have Fun Larping, Toodles. Hi everybody out there, I really hope you enjoy uh, the play acting of Tournay. This is the most difficult thing about burlesque, is lacing yourself into a corset when you've got it.
So, so yes, the, the, um, the, the most rewarding thing is when you start do, having fiction and reality start blending and talking to each other. And that was something we learned about this, uh, this experience. I will skip that last one, which, is, uh, which would take too much time, but this is a project I'm working on, on trying to use the second screen uh, in a creative way, meaning that right now most, um, most projects that in, involve a second screen use it as a way to access enriched content and, and additional content. I would like to start seeing directors use the second screen in a creative way as part of the story, but I will, I will skip that. I just want to end by saying, like, we, like it's been said before, that I think to all of us, the um, uh, transmedia is really just a, a, an extended toolbox that you have at your disposal as a storyteller. But don't lose sight of the fact that you need to have a good story to tell. And it's only once you have one that you can start uh, considering uh, transmedia options to tell your story. If you don't have a good story, transmedia is not going to make it up as a good story. It's going to be uh, useless. So it's uh, transmedia, if there's a lesson to be learned, is not about the tools, it's really about the story. Thank you very much. Like we said, if you have a story, like let's say a series uh, that you designed for television, you can, you can bring it to a mobile screen by uh, having condensed versions. You know that you can have access the next morning after the screening of the first uh, uh, episode of a new season of a series. The next morning you can have an abridged version of about six minutes available on your cell phone. So it's a slicing of the project which is different and it's adapted to the platform which is the phone. But the content that you get on your phone is basically exactly the same content that you would get on your TV and there's no necessarily um, interaction included in, in this adaptation to the new uh, format, to the new platform. While in transmedia, if you did this, you would probably have access to a different side of the story, a different point of view of the same story, you would have interaction involved in it, you would have a, like pieces of a puzzle, a different piece to start completing a bigger picture, which would be the story world. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Hello, I just would like to be a devil's advocate and ask, so what's the outcome of these um, projects? Let's say, okay, it's experience, but did more people uh, saw the film, Louis Fuma, that you said, or was it the big impact on the audience? What's the, what's the outcome of that? You're talking of the marketing uh, project that I presented, yeah? Uh, yes, we tried to measure. The film uh, sold eight, about 80,000 tickets, and we tried to evaluate how many people came because they did the experience of the post-its. It's very difficult, I mean, it would have taken a whole budget to measure it, you know, really precisely, so we did it by asking people in different theaters outside of the, uh, after they saw the movie. We evaluated that it was about 10%. 10% of the 80,000 tickets were direct um, outcomes from the, uh, from the post-it campaign. Um, I don't know if it's significant or not. I have no, no way to judge. But the, um, the word of mouth around the, the campaign was quite strong and it was related by the press 
we had a lot of press around this new way of communicating around the film. So if you combine the 10% of the tickets sold with the, uh, the, the promotion impact that it had, I think it was far worth it. The, 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 the cost of doing this was about 23,000 euros, paying the students to handwrite and to post it in the streets mostly. That's a lot. It's a lot, but we paid everyone because it was Arte, and we can't do it like an independent producer might be able to do, you know, uh, by um, not paying, you know, the minimum fees that one needs to pay. So it was expensive. The same way uh, producing the LARP was about 10,000 euros, and we would not have paid this if we were not Arte at the time. But when you're a public institution, uh, you can't do things, you know, uh, so just uh, another question, is, is it worth doing it for the, just for the experience and for the 10% of the more viewers? I think it's definitely worth it. I, the, the thing is that I, we could not do it again. We could not do the same thing again because it's been used already and this is the kind of thing you can only do once, uh, at least in the same country. Uh, but I'm definitely encouraged to find similar ideas uh, for for uh, poor films uh, again definitely because the kind of relationship that you build with the audience I mean it's so everything that Domenico talked about and will be talked about now it's how do you engage with the audience and it doesn't matter if you if you reach only a few people but the ripple effect that you have through this is very very um, important actually and very useful. There's a whole trend in advertising right now which I find fascinating is the stage re reality within which a brand will stage a situation uh, in the real world and we'll have real people get involved in it and the, the empathy that the viewer has with the film is much bigger than if it was an actor because I can I can project myself into the film thinking it could have been me. We don't have the time to show, but there, I've. Michel, I just wanted to ask the example with the budgets. What would art normally use for advertisement? Uh, uh, on a project like that, a film like that, compared to what you would normally do, and the price about 23,000 euros? Um, this was on top of what we did, what we usually do on films, which is um, in certain cases buying advertising space in newspapers. We actually bought space that reproduced the sticker, the, the post-it. It did nothing. No one, I mean, just a few people called because it was printed and because it was not handwritten. Um, but otherwise, we would do uh, we would do a few premiere screenings for um, uh, uh, word of mouth, uh, which we would finance, and we would um, uh, finance a cocktail. Uh, but uh, that's it. We have one more question. Should I? Um, cool. Actually, I can answer right now because my, my question was uh, about this story, not like a case of advertising, but uh, like a story to tell, uh, which was born, <coughs> which was born uh, inside of campaign. It's a brand new story about the post-it, about the phone calls, about the conversations. And for me, it's much more interesting uh, what was the development, the growing of this story. Maybe you would like to create as a new brand, new topic, not for conference, but for movie or something like that. Uh, it's a very interesting question because it took me a whole year to convince the director and the producer that we should do this campaign because they were afraid it would actually damage the image of the film by trivializing it. So it took me a, a, a hard work talking to them, convincing them that it was okay to do it. And the way I did it is that I asked the director to actually script what would happen to his character once the movie was finished. And we worked together, he and I, to, to um, script a world which is her world after the movie ends. And she got this script and she could improvise within this 
these lines of the world that we had written. So that it was a new story in a way. And what's interesting is that the people who called and had some awareness of the film and its story all asked about this. So what are you doing now? Where are you now? We haven't done anything with it and we don't have the means to do anything with it. But what's really interesting is that after the whole experience was finished and the film was quite a success, um, the director and the producer have asked me to help them devise new ideas on their next films. Uh, the producer is now finishing a film on mathematics uh, called How I Hate Math. And with him, we have developed a whole uh, interactive uh, ecosystem around the film, and that's thanks to this experience. But the story itself, yes, we were not doing anything with it. <laughs>